stories with literature. And electronic means that there has been either some intervention in the authoring process, which involves digital technology, or in the delivery process, which has digital technology. I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents beset by fear and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon, the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says without emotion, one way or another. I wrote this in Michigan. I actually can remember the sound of on freezing days. They may, may not have been oaks exploding, but the trees kind of popping off along the ridge. And I remember also having walked to my office and seen the afternoon melt freezing across the blacktop like crystal octopi. I'm having an incredible deja vu looking at the screen. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. A check tablecloth lay in an isolated clearing. A bottle of red wine, two glasses, cheese, and bread. Walking the sound of water. water. Wait, the sound mountains. of water. Or a bottle Wait, of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a wooden tablecloth. tablecloth. Cold Four water, crystal goblets, Four unexpectedly, crystal goblets midnight. unexpectedly at midnight, purple lupine on the hillside. Beside the Dempsey dumpster in town, walking down to the water, where the homeless gather. A flower, a flower dress, dress, unexpected woodland events, wait capped spring water in winter, a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a linen tablecloth, cold, cold water. water, a flower dress, the smell of hops and honey. The smell of green in grass, outflow of stone by the river. The a smell of front green door. grass, under Warm the eaves of the by the river. The, the cabin where we were working. The sound of water, white capped mountains, purple lupine on the hillside, making love. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context. Uh, to achieve uh, effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My breath takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen. Or it took place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell when that's possible in the future. At the present, it starts with image very dominantly and proceeds through text to sound in kind of a, a hierarchy, which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions both at the code, the sonic, the visual and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means. And in traditional vision-based media, you have moving pictures, you have more traditional genres, such as you know printed text where things don't move around. But electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts, how we perceive the world and ourselves, and trying to portray that using computation, using the specific processes that are unique to computers. There are two main literary parents for me, for, for the fiction, and one of them is Thomas Pynchon mm -hmm. and um, Gravity's Rainbow, which is a novel which contains within it music hall numbers, popular songs, equation. Uh, there are there are no there are no visible artworks, but there is a tremendous reference to the language of, of art and film 
and music and theater. And that was a that was a mental model for me that the novel did not have to proceed in a linear fashion using only narrative. Electronic literature for me is literature that takes advantage of the capacity of new media to um, alter the state of writing. It's it's literature that engages its digitality. I remember sitting in my office in, in Jackson, Michigan, at Community College, and thinking. Prepared. Sugar is not a quest. Quest. In the For glass the door, these certain methods, very clean that there, there is no seen pleasure. variety, very, very clean small there is no pleasure. Overly moist prepared. Sugar is not a volume. Not having examined the room, grabbing at these rags, kindness related to the vulture. And shape, however, in varying sides of the door, for the sake, for the sake journey to use, last, they open. are double. For the same and rapid exploration requires most common classes while the body by the crowd justified by appeal. Electronic literature is two words that go together, resonate together. Uh, I, I suppose I would say it is can be considered practice involving text that resonates with considerations of media, it resonates with uh, problems of media or platforms of media taking advantage of platforms of media as Amrit said or for me resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation and digitization of information communication. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Mac Paint if anyone knows what that is. It's just like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself. Click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text, the graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read and the device has to be electronic. And I work with artist books. Um, I was influenced by the works that I saw, camera works, um, by um, works in San Jose, which is um, and by the art space at San Jose State that Stephen Muir Moore curated. So I was in a field that was halfway between visual arts and halfway between writing. And of course, performance art also that I was associated with, and the artist books. So those were interests that I continued with. Electronic literature is machine-enabled stories, poems, images uh, that are not available only as traditional print or uh, sculptural uh, events. They're mediated by machines and they don't exist in a, a format that the other arts have traditionally taken. Boxes, raising the dirt, only several colors, tall the one cluster away, variety each a method, package of seeds, the several not in rows. Hi, I'm Dini Grigar, the director of the Electronic Literature Lab here at Washington State University, Vancouver. For the past four years, we've been hosting traversals of early hypertext literature in order to document it for posterity and reignite interest in it for a new generation of readers. Our traversals focus primarily on the works of electronic literature I've collected over the years in my personal library that were published on very fragile um, media, and those include floppy disks and CD-ROMs. My collection includes the physical copies of the 48 titles published by Eastgate Systems, Inc., which I value dearly. To date, the lab has completed traversals for 28 of these 48 titles. The traversal today of Kathy Mack's Unnatural Habitats marks the final one for the season. The open source multimedia book, Electron Rebooting Electronic Literature, that we publish and make available annually that features videos from these traversals along with important documentation like images of the physical media and scholarly essays about the work will be released at the end of the summer. 
so look for the announcement on Twitter and Facebook later on. Because it's the last traversal of the season, I'd like to take the opportunity to recognize and thank those who made season four so successful. And I'm going to start with Greg Philbrook, the Labs Tech Guru, who's been instrumental in the broadcast, in the, running the broadcast and helping me with selecting and setting up the appropriate computer for these events. And this is no small feat when we're working with this legacy media. Holly Slocum, the lab's project manager, designed the promotional materials, except for this last one, Sarah West did this one, and oversaw the logistics for all these events. Dr. John Barber, with the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program, has ensured excellent sound quality for the videos and has produced the podcast made available from the lab's website, even buying two new uh, um, microphones for today. David Alonzo and Joel Clapp have edited the video captured during the, tra the traversal into small clips for the book. Kathleen Zoller and Dan Walker have produced much of the content for the book already, and this work includes painstakingly describing the video and the images in the form of ephrastic writing and styling the book's aesthetics and functionality. Dan, by the way, comes to us from Reed College, where he just graduated with a degree in English. He's funded by Reed to work with us this summer on this project, so shout out to Reed College for your support of this project in the lab, and Dan. I also want to recognize Richard Snyder, who, who as of July 1st, is now the Assistant Director of the Electronic Literature Lab. Richard is working with us on the development of the metadata for our many project, projects and has helped us conceptualize the method for integrating scholarship with the creative work that we archive. And this is a real interesting innovation that we're doing in the lab with archiving. Finally, I've been so lucky to have Mariusz Pizarski and Astrid Ensign as research affiliates this year to lead traversals with me and contribute to the scholarship of the book. And I'm happy to say that Mariusz will continue on as research affiliate next year. He and I are working on our book together with Cambridge University Press entitled The Challenges of Born Digital Fiction, Editions, Translations, and Emulations. Today, Astrid will be leading this traversal of Kathy Mack's Unnatural Habitats. So let me now turn the event over to her and thank you everybody for being here today and joining us and making this a successful fourth year. Welcome everyone for me as well, um, and uh, just a big thanks to Beanie as well. I mean, at this point, it's just been amazing to, to be working with you and to, to do this under your leadership. It's been a great experience. So, um, yes, welcome to the live stream traversal of Kathy Mack's Unnatural Habitats, hosted by the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Astrid Enslin, research affiliate of the lab and hypertext scholar. And with me remotely are Kathleen McConnell, alias Kathy Mack, Mariusz Pizarski, and Beanie Grigar, the director of the lab, who will be operating the computer directly from the lab. Kathy will be guiding Beanie remotely via Zoom while she reads from Beanie's computer screen via YouTube. So for the playthrough, we'll be using the 3.5-inch floppy version on a Mac Classic, running system software, software 7.1, the software was released in August 1993 and sold through August 1994. And there's a fair amount of lag. I mean, you know, we kind of were managing, but it's still a little bit of lag in the YouTube transmission, which we apologize for. We'll be bridging these gaps by listening to Kathy's comments. And as a participant in the event, you'll be able to post questions in the YouTube chat to the author about her work, and she will then respond either during the reading, um, you know, when, when there is time, or um, at the end in the Q&A, led by Kathy Marius, Bini, and myself. Unnatural Habitats is a poetic hypertext pastiche that critiques phallocentric techno-teleology by experimenting with the text space as an aesthetic and dynamic poetic medium. The work was originally published in issue 1.3, 1994, of the Eastgate Quarterly Review of Hypertext and came bundled with Catherine Kramer's in small and large pieces, of which we also did a traversal in March, as some of you will remember. And um, I've, I've put a lot of sort of background here to show you, um, uh, to, to, you know, kind of represent and echo the original publication, which was in a folio. So you can see the hands, the different colored hands. I mean, red was new at the time, 
But I also wanted to make clear that Kathy's uh, very own cover here, uh, the black and white one, that was actually hers, right? So she will probably talk a little bit more about this beautiful, you know, pastiche and layering and weaving in, in a moment. That was made in super paint. Unnatural Habitats was originally produced with StorySpace 1.5 and used 1,400K, 96 writing spaces, and 288 links. It was shipped on 3.5 inch floppy and later on CD-ROM. And according to the Eastgate catalog, the work, quote, sings the poetry of primitive submarines, crippled spaceships, and basement apartments. Canadian poet Kathy Mack explores the consequences of American idealism from the Apollo 13 tragedy to the U.S. invasion of Kuwait. My forthcoming book, Pre-Web Digital Publishing and the Lore of Electronic Literature, which is out later this year in, with Cambridge University Press, dedicates an entire chapter to this work and situates it in the historical context of mid-1990s writing and publishing in emergent digital media. So at this point, I just want to, um, you know, do a big shout out again to the um, entire team um, at the lab, at the Media Lab, the many staff members of the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program who've made this possible, this entire series. Um, it's been a very smooth and very enjoyable experience. And um, yeah, it's great to, to know that this will continue. Finally, let me just add that uh, the video captured from today's traversal will be edited and placed on the lab's Vimeo channel and added to the lab's annual publication, Rebooting Electronic Literature. There will also be essayistic material by this group that will accompany the chapter in rebooting. So without much further delay, I would like to hand it over now to Kathy, and I look forward to her traversal of Unnatural Habitat. Thanks so much, Astrid. That's uh, very kind. I'm so honored to be included in this in this project that you're doing. It's very ambitious, and I think you're doing a magnificent job with some very <laughs> old technology. Um, I am talking to you from New Brunswick, Canada, which is the traditional territory of the um, Wolastook people, the Passamaquoddy, the Maliseet, and the Mi'kmaq, who signed uh, peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. And I'm sure some of you are sitting on other parts of Turtle Island or other places around the world and have a similar sense of the background of the land um, on, on which you are situated. So, <laughs> Unnatural Habitats. When Unnatural Habitats was published in 1994, I was an art college grad. I was moonlighting as a poet, and I was working at the first desktop publishing business in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. My boss, a fellow named Bob Atkinson, there was only the two of us at the business, he was a serious tech geek, hugely enthusiastic about the social and cultural transformation, transformations that digitization was bringing with it not least, of course, with publishing. I still remember us getting our first recipe book from a church group by a dial-up. Uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, he, it, this was cutting edge at the time, folks. So it was Bob who got me thinking about hypertext and about making a hypertext. So a couple of the threads in Unnatural Habitats were poems before they became hypertexts but most were written for the hypertext. And right now, I mean, 27 years ago it was published, so I don't remember which is which. I think Alberto Santos Dumont, that thread, was the first. It was a very early one in any case. The whole thing is about uh, unnatural habitats. Uh, the top six, so you can see the table of contents right there, the top six, take the idea pretty um, literally. Of course, there's a metaphorical context to it, but they take it pretty literally. Uh, they are about the elements that are unnatural, the strange places that people get themselves. Space, sky, underground, underwater, in fire, okay? The four that follow after that are conceptual unnatural habitats, and they explore the way that we limit ourselves and the world around us 
in our minds, by our minds. And then the two after that are actually hybrid texts. The, the final two, they take little bits and pieces from all the other ones and run their own thread, create their own little warp or their own little weft. So those are the pieces of, uh, of unnatural habitats. Um, Dini, I'd like to start with interface, Apollo 13 interface. So space is the only one of the um, elements that deals with two, that has two poems. I always, I think of these two poems, or these two threads as a diptych. They probably be a part one, part two kind of a feeling to them. And you can see in the table of contents that they're actually, the um, re-entry is first because I think it's the most dramatic of the two, but interface is better, I think, as an introduction to the concepts behind this. So it reads, let me just, an O2 tank exploded, unevenly blasting the ceramic heat shield. Fatigue humbled astronauts pit themselves against blackness too cold to respect. A small thing bound by metal and gravity and limited resources, air, water, energy, ingenuity. You can go to the next one. Um, I like the, okay, here we go. On the ground, 96 men suffer dislocation. The problem out there, hitching around the moon. The solution, somewhere in between, riding airwaves. Okay, so this is the um, it's April 1970, the Apollo 13 uh, uh, space mission is underway and an oxygen tank explodes on the way to the moon and suddenly it's a disaster and will they be able to get these people home? And we won't know for a week. Okay, so that's what this piece is about. Okay, we can go. Yeah, the lead retro officer in charge of reentry, so that's the guy on the ground, practices patience while seeming swamped. Shanghai from one emergency to the next, knowing three minutes are coming when practice will have to be perfect, when all anyone down here can do is nothing. nothing. Okay. So what happens is during that week, those guys on the, um, on the space capsule had to survive for a whole week in space without enough resources and fix everything that got broken in the initial explosion. And there's no way they could know whether or not the heat shield that was that protects the capsule when it goes through the atmosphere into re-entry, there's no way they could know whether or not that had been damaged. So that was the big uncertainty. So the, that's the moment when contact is cut off by kiln hot, hot friction and the usual comet of flame created by a capsule boring down into the envelope of air around Earth, heat shield bearing the brunt. Okay. Next one. All right, so let's have a look. Can we have a look at the map to the one that I just read first? Maybe not. Okay. Let's have a look. We'll go to interface. We'll, we'll leave the map. Maybe we'll talk a bit about that in the Q&A or to re-entry. Thank you. So these three guys have been struggling for a week. One of them has a really bad infection. He's quite sick. Um, and the captain of the ship, James Lovell, says, it would be better to burn up like a meteor than not come back at all. Okay. 
So one thing that you can see about story space is that it's got these links that go from space to space. And I actually, you can see I made patterns with the, uh, with the little windows of text and stretched the links around between those to make a kind of a visual aspect in the, in the mirror, in the, uh, in the poems, in the links. So there's the quote from James A. Lovell. It'd be better to burn up like a meteor than not come back at all. That's how he was feeling by that time in the expedition. Can we go to the next one, please? Now, these guys are astronauts, they're test pilots, and they're very pragmatic people. Okay, they're very, they know that they are role models for much of North America. Kids all over the world idolize them, and they're engineers, pretty much all of them. Okay, now this one, I just want to tell you, this one is patterned on a spiral. I was thinking of the idea of falling back into the gravity egg, gravity well. So you'll notice that this particular piece of text has a really strong uh, left to right diagonal going on in it. Okay, just keep that in mind. Astronauts are not chosen for imagination, but I feel something in my bones beyond gravity's insistent greeting after our week long absence. We will die in the next three minutes. So you see that one sort of carries that diagonal long line down. Can we have the next one, please, Dini? I'm just going to check and see if I have something else to say. Can we have the next one, please, Dini? Oh, there we go. OK, got it. Thank you. OK, so you see that. Low that diagonal is starting to turn, so it's becoming a right to left diagonal going down. We will die in the next three minutes or live knowing even 300,000 desperate miles in a crippled spacecraft isn't enough to breach the distance between skulls. So you can click to the next one. So that long line is deliberate. The idea is to give you a sense of just how extreme this is by giving you a short line, long, long, long line, short line, fairly short line, okay? And it's all about communication. You know, they're, they're communicating with the earth and they're trying to communicate with each other. They're just trying to survive. It isn't enough to breach the distance between skulls, despite the disembodied radio voices that all three of us heard and heeded with an apparently perfect faith. So these pragmatic men are stuck in space communicating with Earth as disembodied voices. So it's almost a spiritual experience they're having, except it's extremely pragmatic. And so that was at the bottom. And now we're starting to get the right to left uh, angle going up to sort of continue our spiral. So it's not enough, despite the radio voices, despite our struggle together against the indiscriminate gauntlets of space, freezing, boiling, dehydration, condensation, asphyxiation, inertia, exhaustion, emptiness, despair. We can talk about unnatural habitats. So they're struggling with all these things and trying to have engineering faith. But one undetectable flaw in an uncertain shield will mingle us utterly, a micron thin layer of ash above the air, okay? We can't communicate with our minds, but you know, if that heat shield is broken, we are going to be so one. <laughs> there will be nothing separating us from each other or the entire world, the entire existence. We fought so damned hard for this chance to die like moths. And again, we've got the uh, left to right going up spiral, sort of heading, finishing off that spiral that we started from the very beginning. And then we get to this last bit. And die like moths is such a fragile natural image for something that's happening that's so technologically mediated, right? So deliberate, deliberate choice. And then we have this last bit 
which is centered and just going down, 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 which is basically what they're doing, going down, down, down. And it sort of has the shape of the capsule, not exactly. The capsule skips, flaring pink and purple over the first thin veils of atmosphere. Static N interferes and then ends all radio contact. And I begin to pray for our fall. Through the noise between space and earth, the silence between each other. Okay, thank you, Dean. So we can uh, go back to the table of contents. And I think we'll, we'll stay in the sky anyway. Let's have a look at Alberto Santos Dumont. So there's a lot of these poems deal with doubles or binaries or partnerships. Uh, the idea of inside and out in that last one, the, the idea of down on the earth and up in the sky, um, individual identity versus working together, you know, all these different, different binary oppositions. And a lot of the poems here do that. Um, Alberto Santos Dumont is the one that's about the sky. Uh, Dumont was a Brazilian uh, airplane designer. He was one of the first people to design a functioning airplane uh, at roughly the same time as Kitty Hawk and uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright. And uh, his story is very poetic, I think, and very beautiful. And yet it's not, it's tragic as well. It's, it's tragic. So his starts low on the screen and works up. Hang on a minute, there we go. And it, it's got a first half that goes after, after detail. And then it's got a second half that goes before, before detail. And the first half is uplifting, just like the plane was uplifting. And the second half, it sinks down and uh, you'll see why when I read you the poem. So first part, which we've already gone past, is after turning from his first love, dirigibles, to heavier than air machines, after Orville and Wilbur proved that wire and wood could fly, up, I can, I want to see the next bit, it's up in the top. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm, there we go. Alberto Santos Dumont took the Deutsche Archdeacon Award for Aviation and lost his buoyant heart to a bare bamboo fusel fuselage, pliant silk wings. Okay, you can go to the next one, Dean. Um, so the sounds in that, there's a lot of bees, buoyant, it's like boyish. Um, and bare bamboo fuselage. And there's just a sort of uplifting feeling about that, I think. Demoiselle, that's what he called his airplane. Demoiselle gave him the sky and he tried to give it back to the world, published his plane's unpatented design in Popular Mechanics, 1910. Okay, Demoiselle means, means dragonfly. And uh, yes, he, he was an idealist. He, he didn't think that any one person should be able to fly because everybody dreams about flying. So he, he, gave his, his, uh, he gave his design away. And then we start at the top and start working down. So the first one was before he hanged himself with his necktie. Before he suspected that the flying craft he helped create would carry bombs to defend boundaries he never once saw from the air. So that's what I talked about, the going down motion of this poem. Yeah, and that's pretty devastating. Alberto Santos Dumont liked to take his binoculars down to the pond and watch dragonflies all afternoon. So there you've got, uh, okay, we can go back to the table of contents. That one just has a really nice, almost a teeter-totter motion to it. You know, it goes up and up and up for the first half and down and down and down in the second half. Okay. 
So the next one I wanted to talk about was um, the submarine patrol. Okay. okay, there we go. There we go. Submarine patrol 1915. Okay, so in this in this poem, it starts with the saying, at a depth of 15 graves under the surface. Now, a fathom is how you measure distance nautically. That's a traditional nautical measure of distance. And it happens to be six feet, which is exactly the same distance as you're supposed to dig for a grave. So I thought, oh, it was 15 fathoms down. So that means I can say 15 graves. Because submariners are always... I mean, it's a very dangerous place to be. It's an unnatural habitat. So at a depth of 15 graves under the surface with 30 or more to the bottom, 15 men rest. Okay, so how do they rest? Uh, well, they're in a specific place. Um, the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea, both at different times flow into the Sea of Marmara. The Aegean goes through the Dardanelles. So that's what this stanza is about. In the Sea of Marmara, where two bodies of water surge, unmixing the fresh, a deep shroud over the dense brine beneath. Okay, so the Aegean is much saltier than the Black Sea. So the two bodies of water go into the same place, but they don't mix. So at night, captains order ballast, ballast tanks filled. They dive down and down, too heavy for the upper ocean. But no matter how much weight is added, they can't descend into the layer of brown, brine. They come to a complete stop, suspended and stable, safe on the border between the salt and the sweet. It's the strangest idea. It really inspired me, this idea that they could rest as if they were resting on a, on the bottom, but it was just the dis difference in density between the two kinds of water. Um, so that's where, that's where that one came from. Okay, so next I was going to do Mining the Perfect Monument. Okay, so underground. We've gone from outer space and vacuum to air to water. It's getting heavier and heavier. Um, now we're underground. Uh, this poem is from the point of view of a miner. And well, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read the poem first. Uh, when we go down, we turn the world into the opposite of sculpture. And I love those three lines. When we go down, we turn the world. Uh, it means one thing and then into the opposite of sculpture, suddenly you have another meaning just due to the line break. Um, so what's sculpture? Sculpture is a solid in space. Well, a mine is a space in solid, a hole shaped like the life of a body worming through time, a tunnel comprised of all moments in sequence. I was thinking of time-lapse photographs when I wrote that and how they look like a tunnel. Um, and that, that's kind of what a mine looks like. And if you lived your life in the mines, that would be what it feels like. And then I was thinking, okay, well, how else can I um, describe this? Well, or the opposite. Turning the world into a carving, emerging continuously with every oh so slight pock on the surface of a planet, 700 million times larger than each egg of grief that lodges at the back of a throat blocking the passage. A cold stone wrapped around something tiny and burning. And again, I'm thinking about the people who have lost people in mines. There's been several mi mining disasters in my region in the last 20 years, and we hear about them on the news and just how hard it is for the people on top. You have that egg of grief. Okay, thank you, Dini. We can go back to the table of contents. Okay, so we're at the last of the elemental poems.
poems. This one is about fire. It's called Testimonial Q8, April 1991. And it's another two-part poem. It starts first with a quote and then a little bit of explanation or a little bit expansion on what's going on there. And then it's got another quote and then a little more explanation. It's the story of a couple of journalists and what happened to them in Kuwait. Two journalists got lost in thick smoke on a highway. They drove into a lake of burning oil and were engulfed in flames. Okay, you can see it kind of makes almost a flame shape in behind there. Uh, the, the, the links, the way the links are straggled around. Maclean's is a news magazine in Canada. The air was black, no, the sky was black, air replaced with ash, smoke came down. We followed the story, researched it with each lungful of flame, screamed it back to the network, but fire drowned us out. And anyway, you've heard it before. Where have you heard it before? In the Bible. Whoever did not have his name written in the book of the living was thrown with death into the lake of fire. Revelations 24, 2015. Still, we tell the only story over and over in every candle, every tongue of flame, every tongue of fire in the universe. Okay, so, I mean, journalists put themselves in these positions. Our name is burning and the edges of the book of life curl and smoke. So I didn't really talk too much about how each of these elemental poems are not just about humans being in strange places, but also about who is motivated to go to these strange places, test pilots and you know, drafted soldiers and journalists, who, who goes there? Okay, so we need to go back, Dini, to the table of contents. This we just accidentally got onto one of the warp or weft poems here. But if we go back to the table of contents, we will get to... I think we'll start with uh, when these came out of the closet, he, he went in. We're getting into the conceptual poems now. Conceptually unnatural habitats. Um, the, let me just, sorry, can we, I can't see the title page there. I forget it's what it's called. coming right now. Uh, not basement, not vicariously. No. Nope. Signifier um, sign and sold. Quilt. 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 Okay. Quilt. Love that this one. one. Yes. So this one, I don't know if you remember the AIDS quilt. In the 1980s, there was a huge stigma of dying with dying from AIDS. Okay. Funeral homes would refuse to deal with the AIDS, AIDS victims. So people wouldn't get memorials. They would just disappear. And in the military, you couldn't be gay. You just couldn't be gay in the military. There was no don't ask, don't tell policy. It was just was not done. And God help you if you got AIDS and were in the military. So there is this quilt project. People who wanted to do something to remember their loved ones that they lost made a quilt. They made quilt squares. They were three feet by six feet. And there are now 59 tons worth of these quilts. They covered the entire mall um, um, park in Washington. Uh, thousands and thousands of these quilt pieces. And it, a section of them came to Halifax and I walked around the arena and looked at these quilts. And one of, them, one of the squares um, struck out, stood out for me. And it came with a quote, the person who titled it called said, when these came out of the closet, he went in. A statement hand embroidered on one quilt among many. Many. Okay, so this is somebody who loves somebody who has died. 
and uh, he's wrote, written, when these, when these came out of the closet, he went in. Well, what? It's one quilt among many, lined up row upon row, shrouding a football field. Sorry, it wasn't an arena, it was a football field. And you'll see this one, the pieces move around the screen like pieces, like blocks of a quilt. Just a blanket made out of pieces. It was what the pieces were made of, though. Those were what really got my imagination. They were the pieces of an army uniform. Cocky shirt fronts and sleeves, cuffs and collars. And not just that they were there, they were painstakingly, obsessively picked apart at the seams. Reduced to random shapes and reassembled to fit a different pattern. So it felt to me like this person had gone from had this quilt piece emblematized, emblematized somebody who had to unpick and restitch his life, uh, his private life and his public life, his home life and his military life, had to become a completely different person. To fit a different pattern, front and center and everything. Okay, so. Uh, let's next have a quick look at the um, signifier sign sold, the dolphin one, please, Dean. So this one, if you look in the background, you'll see the, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but the, the links between the text boxes make a zigzag pattern. I think I was going for something that was kind of wave-like. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> you have to remember I'm an art college grad who couldn't make a living as an artist <laughs> when I wrote this one. And yes, it is a reference to Saussure uh, in the title. A dolphin in a pool somewhere on the prairies chooses colors carefully and brush and beak makes marks on watercolor paper. Okay, so uh, yeah, we've got animals making art. And again, meanings shift with each stanza break. Okay, we can go to the next one. Thank you, Dini. You can go to the next one as well. Animal rightists claim exploitation, lobby for city-bred Sammy's release into an alien ocean. Okay, so he's in a pool on the prairies. Animal rightists want him to be released into an ocean where he's never been, right? But he likes painting something no wild dolphin has ever done, exclaims a lovely pool employee at the opening of Sammy's solo exhibition in a commercial gallery. So you can see how every line accrues meaning, accrues meaning, changes the meaning of what came before. Okay, we can go to the next one. So it's not just the narrator saying he likes painting, it's somebody talking about how, but he likes painting where the least of his marks. Okay, so he's getting an opening. He's having a solo exhibition in a commercial gallery. Where the least of his marks means $500. Okay, so I'm pretty sure Sammy's not gonna see those 500 bucks. <laughs> so to me, that was a conceptual in unnatural habitat. Like the unnaturalness of those habitats is just marked all over that particular situation. All right, let's try living vicariously at Basement Oblivion, please. Now this one, you know what? We can, we can go through this one pretty fast. It's, it's about bread and circuses. It's about how if we are distracted enough we won't notice how unnatural the world is in, that we live in. You can learn everything that matters from a monitor. T 
TV teaches fun how to spend money. You'll note the internet didn't really exist when I wrote this. Videos give li living color lessons in how good it feels to get fucked. You can go to the next. <laughs> Arcade games will show you how to score to get satisfaction from exploding enemies. Now you can actually play with real people from millions of real people all around the world. Flashing showers of red, black, and blue promise to keep you permanently distracted. From what? From the concrete floor sweaty walls, and daily demands of mortality. Okay. Now, there is another poem in this series. It's, um, for a while, I lived in northern Pakistan in the late 1970s, and I encountered women in Purda for the first time in my life. But I'm not going to read this particular poem. I don't think it's aged well. It feels judgmental. It feels a bit appropriative. So we'll just skip that. Let's go on to the lot, bottom two poems, warp, The Warp and the Weft. Okay. Um, so warp first, I think that's what we've called it. Uh, the Texture of Falling, let's try that. Please. That's fine. It seems to sort of come and go, but it always seems to get back into focus. So we're good. Okay. So these two poems are made up of bits and pieces from the other poems. Uh, now, the problem with that is that story space wasn't really meant to do this. So when we get to the end of the poem, it doesn't, story space doesn't know that and it just carries on with the old poem. So I would say these were not 100% successful experiments. I think if I had to do it again, I would write a final stanza for each of these that took you right outside of the links with the other ones. But at the time, I wanted to be a purist and only have links to other poems. So the weft. Text, noun, textus, woven, also fabric, structure from texturi to weave. Just a blanket made out of pieces, created by a capsule boring down into the envelope of air around Earth. I thought the, uh, we can go to the next one. I thought the capsule, the Apollo 13 capsule, was almost like it was pun punching a hole between fabrics, right? On the ground, 96 men suffer dislocation. Okay, so... These poems are more elliptical in their meanings and they're found in a lot of ways. So uh, I couldn't tell you, you can see how it's made a woven pattern uh, to pull the, pull the different pieces together. I, I couldn't, yeah, this is found. So the, the meanings are uh, implied rather than storytelling, rather than narrative, okay. Um, we've kind of come out of the, oh, there it is. Reduced to random shape and reassembled. Whoever did not have his name written in the book of the living was thrown in, with death into the lake of fire. Okay, so we're dislocated, we're reduced to random shapes, we're thrown with death into the lake of fire. So we've crossed from space to, um, to, fire, and then we go to the mine, a cold stone wrapped around something tiny and a small thing bound by metal and gravity. So that idea of being bound by metal and gravity, it goes between the Apollo 13, but it also goes to Alberto Santos Dumont and his Demoiselle, right? So a small thing bound by metal and gravity after Orville and Wilbur proved that wire and wood could fly. And then we go back to space. And I began to pray for our fall through the noise between space and earth, the silence between 
each other. So that's the end of that piece. Although, yeah. So we go back to the table of contents and we have a quick look. I believe this one is the odds and ends. Is it odds and ends? I forget what it's called. <laughs> the ability to show the map. Even though there's a lag, it does allow us to see how fabulous the map is and the way you wove these these bits of text together. Thanks, Danny. Very important. Yeah, it, that was a lot of fun. It was a pain, but it was fun. Okay, odds and ends. Forget your promised quarter hour of fame. Okay, that's a section from a poem that got taken out. <laughs> I think it was something about Andy Warhol. Uh, yes. Okay, we can go to the next one. Forget your promised quarter hour of fame. Do you go on? Okay, mm -hmm. there we go. Oh, is it going to let us go? Yes, we will die in the next three minutes. Forget your promised quarter hour of fame. We will die in the next three minutes on the border between the salt and the sweet. Can you go to the next one? This one is kind of uh, mortal. Still, we tell the only story over and over in every candle, in every tongue of fire in the universe. Okay, next. Flashing showers of red, black, and blue promise to keep you permanently distracted. Go to the next one. So, quarter hour of fame, no, we're gonna die on the border between the salt and the sweet. But we'll tell the only story that's told all the time. It's sort of flashy. We watch dragonflies all afternoon. Next. Why? Because you can learn anything that matters, everything that matters from a monitor screen. Next one. Or from the concrete floor, sweaty walls, and daily demands of mortality. Next one. And limited resources air, water, energy, ingenuity. Okay, so that's that. That's that last one. So those are the poems. And then it, and then it sort of swings into the next poem, which we've already talked about. Do you want to talk about your map a little bit? It's so wonderful, and we don't get to see them for if all the hypertext. you want to take us to the table of contents. Yeah, I just clicked on it. It should be coming up in just a second. Yep. Okay, okay. And I want to say what's interesting about this is that these double clickings that we have to do to bring up things, it mm -hmm. doesn't always automatically change. I have to do it a couple of times, so if it looks like it's not working, it's because it's just something in the... You know, it's an old computer, it's an old mouse, it's an old work. <laughs> Story space was squirrely too. It was not designed to do what I'm doing. Actually, let's stay on, on this. Can we stay on this one? No, we've already clicked it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, that's okay. Um, it wasn't designed to do what I was doing with it. I was, this is off-brand use. Um, and so it, it's squirrely. It doesn't, you know, I was pushing it to be something that it wasn't. And I think some of the things were fantastic, but I think, you know, they were kind of fun. But I think some of the things, it was like, nope. <laughs> like, the, like the inability to end the final two poems where I wanted to end them, because once you got to that thing, I couldn't take the old link away, so it would just carry on to the next to the rest of the poem. But that's fine. I seriously live. Where did you want me to go on this one? What map did you want to show? Okay. Can we have a look at the um, Apollo 13 re-entry map? Yeah. Is 
that's the one that's a spike. So I'm going to try to move the screen out of the way. I'm dragging the top part. For those of you who don't know Story Space, mm -hmm. it looks a lot like Twine. I should say Twine looks a lot like Story Space. Yeah. Which came first? I'm seeing that some people are saying this in the chat. Yep. Yep. I'm going to bring this up a little bit further. It just doesn't cooperate as fast. There we go. You can see it a little bit here. There we go. Can you move that? Yeah, I'm trying to go up a little bit more. How about that? There we, go. there we go. So you can see it kind of starts top left and goes uh, towards the right and down and around until we get to the middle, and that's the final bit of text. So we've got a, almost a Fibonacci sequence or maybe a shell pattern, a spiral. One of my favorite, favorite things. I just moved a box up so people can see that you can move these boxes around. You could print them out too, yeah. and it prints out top to bottom, left to right. Yeah. So I all the little arrows are links, and mostly people just win story space. They just made a nice little hierarchical drawing, and went, you know, did it pretty easily. But I thought, ooh, these links, these lines stretch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I thought, I'm going to make patterns with these. Can we have a look at Buyer, mm -hmm. the, the one testimonial? Because I haven't seen it for 27 years, and I think it's kind of interesting. I caught a glimpse of it today. Where, do you, where, is, that, where is that located? Is it on this map, or do, you, do I need to go back to the interface? You need to go back to the interface. Okay, excuse me. Okay, I'm clicked back, and I'm <laughs> Richard now going... Side, who thinks that it's... Um, that it's puts he put in mind of NASA diagrams calculating something like reentry angles. Yes, yes, Richard, that was entirely intentional. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm back on this. I'm coming back to the main map interface. Did go you down, want me yeah. to go back to the um, GUI interface or stay on the map? Um, I would like to stay on the map. Okay, that's fine. It'll yeah. show up in okay. just a second. Okay, can you? Click on the one. I, I I can't remember. It might show up as just empty. But it, see, if you just look now, the one on bottom left, it says quilt. And yeah. You can see it, the blocks are set up almost like a quilt. Mm -hmm. um, which one is it? Where is it? Q8. Kuwait. Can we just Kuwait. click on that one and see if we can see that? Yeah. From this section, it does, you only see two blocks. It doesn't look that interesting. But I think... Come on, click. If I can get this way. It's not responding very quickly, so give me a second. Yeah. There it is. There it is. I haven't got it yet. It's coming. I am, I'm being patient. What I like about this one is it's shaped like a star, like it's one of the 50 stars in the American flag. I don't know if that's yeah, intentional. Yeah, that was it. That was, uh, which, like I said, I hadn't, I hadn't seen it until today. I hadn't seen it for 27 years. <laughs> No, not true. I It was published in 94. I'm sure I saw it for a few years after that. But yes, so yeah, I deliberately made a star shape for this. Uh, stars are fiery and also the flag, the American flag. <coughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff. So smart. <laughs> I think we're segueing into the into the Q&A now and the, and the discussion, which is really great. And Astrid's yeah. going to be moderating this, but there's a lot of chatter going on in the uh, chat, which is great. So, um, Astrid, do you want to take over moderating, and I'll be quiet? Yeah, if you want to, because yeah, sure. I really couldn't follow that while I was talking. It would have been too much. It would have, so wonderful. It would have been an interesting train wreck on my part. It's so beautiful. I mean, Dina Larson yeah. says structure equals meaning, and this is exactly what she's talking about right here, the way you've structured these nodes, these lexias, so that they represent the very idea you're talking about. It carries meaning, just that part of it. And that's so strikingly wonderful about Story Space Works and the way you've used this technology. I mean, this is what gets people like Astrid and me excited about this work. It's the kind of intent that artists put on it. And I think that's important for you to, you know, talk about. Well, thanks. Ah. I, I really wanted to do what I was saying. That is really important to me. It's not enough to just make something pretty and surfacey. I wanted when you, the deeper down you went, I wanted it to do what I was saying. 
what the, what the words were saying. And in story space, this is what that meant, right? On, in a more traditional text, this, you know, you could do concrete poetry, I suppose, but I don't know. It just didn't seem to make as much sense to me. This made sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Andrew just said something that, that I can totally relate to, um, you know, and uh, your work seems strangely and wonderfully coherent and in, in that you know everything seems to have its place and everything seems to be a link to something else you know uh, symbolical or or even iconic you know as you iconize what you're trying what you're saying actually and um that in in your in in this cycle it, it's all it's all coming together really well i feel it's it's, it's really it's it's admirable the way you did that um well, you have to remember, I was an art college graduate um, yeah. at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in the 1980s, which was a very conceptual period. It was a very conceptual school at that time. So yeah. I was thinking in that in that direction yeah. as well. But what I also like is, and I, I said quite cryptically, that you were doing ELIT on and off ELIT, because ELIT is all about experimenting with you know, mm -hmm. third-party tools and, and commercial tools, and here you are exploiting a tool that was actually deliberately made for electronic literature, although it wasn't called that at the time, and you are you are pushing its boundaries and you are going beyond it and, and you are experimenting with it. That and that's that's so beautiful. And that's also something that many of the works published in the Eastgate Quarterly were doing yes. in their own works, in their in their own ways, right? Yeah. So um that's that's very important to to realize. Thanks. We got a um, question by Richard Snyder. Yeah. So, Richard, um, he writes, I'm not sure whether you can see it, uh, thank you for presenting today. Were you influenced in your design for the Lexia by any specific examples of concrete poetry or perhaps artist's books? There you go. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember specifics. I've done some concrete poetry. Um, I'm, I like concrete poetry that's three-dimensional. I was doing a lot of textile work, though. Uh, so I think that I'm more hooking into a very traditional way of looking at it as, to, as opposed to a very abstract and contemporary way, way of looking at things. Although I suppose you can't call you know, 18th century poetry contemporary, but because they did a lot of concrete poetry there, too. But the, um, the idea of these links between nodes of text as threads and the relationship, the strong relationship between text and textile uh, has always, always, always fascinated me. My PhD is on textile metaphors in uh, the literature around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Mostly I focus on the Romantics period, but also 18th century up into the Victorian era. So I'm, it's not that I was really heavily looking at contemporary experimental poetry. I was, but I wasn't doing it in a very intentional way, whereas textiles I was very, very much involved in. Okay. Yes. Um, I, sorry, yeah. No, oh, somebody have, said so many artists um, point uh, used metaphors of oh, clothing, yeah. stitching, and sewing. Oh yeah, I got Very a whole true. thesis about that. You can't read a toothpaste tube to me without me finding a textile <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> yeah, that there were a lot of metaphors out there. I mentioned in the chat somewhere my Marie Lo Ryan's work um, and uh, typologies of links and all sorts of things. That, that yes. those were the, the people trying to capture and, and, you know, create ontologies of things out there, whereas now people are saying in, in electronic literature and other avant-garde areas, you, you know, you can't really, you can't, you know, categorize this work. It, it, it's exactly what it's not trying to do. It, it can't be boxed. It can't be, you know, put into an ontology. So it's, put um, it into the unboxable box. <laughs> yeah, the unboxable box. Exactly. Well, even today, Anastasia Salter, one of our, I mean, she, she does so much work with twine. She is working in textile art. She yes. makes quilts. Yeah. You know, which is, you know, it, it goes back, it harkens back 30 years of hypertext. Yes, definitely. Definitely. So I, I have a question which relates to the, you know, pushing the boundaries and, and you know, <laughs> thinking outside the box, literally. 
um, I just published a book on the unnatural. And of course, I had to think about it when um, when I read your work. And it, it's a, a part of post-classical narratology, which looks at exactly those kind of post-structuralist experimental forms that a lot of scholars just really brush off as, oh yeah, that's kind of, you know, it doesn't really fit the patterns, it doesn't, doesn't fit the bill, it's just put it on, on the extreme end of a spectrum. And, um, and the unnatural can be something like a burning lake in the Bible, but it could also be something that is impossible and, um, and unusual, so unusual that it really alienates the experience because there are certain unnatural things happening in literature that are totally you know, naturalized and conventionalized, you know, think of the omniscient narrator, it's humanly impossible to know everything, you know, think of a second person narrator, who is that, you know, what's happening there. Um, but um, yeah, so I was, my question for you is like, uh, the unnatural, it's, it's such an important, you know, theme in your work. Um, but a lot of people would probably think, what is natural anyway? <laughs> and, um, you know, and and the, the, in in cultural studies, you you people are tearing apart notions of nature, uh, na nature and culture, and you know the intersections and so on. So I just, I mean, this is such a huge topic. Um, but maybe, you, I mean, looking back on your work and and what you were thinking when when you designed it, and you know, with the unnatural habitats for animals of all kinds, from d dolphins to humans, and you know, we're all animals, right? Um, so maybe you know. I just throw this out there for you. You have five but minutes. It's, thank you. Natural is a vexed is a vexed term. Yeah. Right. Uh, natural is basically what you're used to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if your experience is if you're used to one thing, then it's natural, and doing something else is unnatural. And uh, so that seems to me a very simplistic way of uh, of you know misrepresenting an issue that's been vexed for at least 300 years, right? Mm -hmm. That I, I keep thinking of um, Pope, his essay on man trying to t teach us that, you know, m man is in the middle state between and has sovereignty, as the Bible tells us, has sovereignty over all that comes beneath it, but everything above man are the are the angelic and that was considered the natural order of things mm -hmm. and that the natural order of things had a hierarchy of who was more human than uh, who who else and you know we just keep breaking that down and breaking that down and breaking that down and keep looking at the idea of natural and realizing that nature is very constructed <laughs> oh yeah as you can see in each one of these poems, right? The, they're all unnatural habitats because they're entirely constructed habitats. Mm -hmm. you know? I, that's all I got to say on that. I don't no, have any it's a Great answer. Thank you. <laughs> we have another question from Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, he wants to know whether you had plans for this project before you encountered Story Space, or did exploring Story Space move you to this project? Okay, I, like I said earlier, I had written a couple of the poems, I'm pretty sure. Fuzzy memories of the past? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. But uh, I had written a couple of these as poems. And then I got introduced to Story Space and I started messing around in there. But at this point, I don't even remember which ones were. I think Alberto Santos Dumont was a poem meant for the page before it got put in here. And there were others that got taken out. There was one about Andy Warhol. <laughs> and a, a few others that, that I thought, because there's so much going on here. There's the visual structure. There's the fitting in as a hypertext. But there's also the good writing. Like I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. And even now, there were things that I go, oh. <laughs> if I could go back to my 24 years ago self, I would say, take that passive verb out there, girl. You do not need that. But <laughs> <laughs> so I'll live with it. Can we talk about the writing a little bit? Because that's something we, mm -hmm. during the rehearsal on Monday, and folks, we do rehearse for these so that we can make an hour traversal and then have some time for Q&A. But during mm -hmm. the rehearsal on Monday, we talked about some of the really wonderful use of language. You pointed out the use of bees in that one 
segment of text and the yeah. the linguistic aspects of this, the repetition, the consonants, the assin assonance, the alliteration, all these things that are lost today in the teaching of literature are so prominent in your work. Kathy, do you want to speak a little bit about your work as a poet? Yeah, I'm just, I'm looking for, uh, hang on a minute, I'm just trying to call one of the poems up um, so I can give you a specific example. I'm not quite sure which one. I, I started to speak a little bit on mining the perfect monument. When we go down, we turn the world. Okay, so that gives you a sense of, I mean, these are the people who in the Industrial Revolution made it possible for everything to happen, for, for mines, for, for mills to work, for railroads to exist, for ships to be built, right? So in some ways, the miners were turning the world. They were making things happen. But the next line is, we turn the world into the opposite of sculpture, OK? A space in solid. So that line break changes the meaning of the previous line. And that's a thing you try to do in poetry. Some poems are just simply telling you a story, and that's fine too. You'll see that all over the place in this series, this series of threads. But in this one, that's one of those places where um, where, where understanding the line break can accrue meaning to the piece. Um, and then the another thing that's going on there is the sounds, the W's and the D's. So the first two lines, when we go down, we turn the world. So down has the D at the beginning and the end at the end, and world has the W at the beginning and the D at the end. So, uh, sorry, it's D's and W's. Right, so there's a sort of um, a mirror thing going on with those two words, entirely subliminal. It's not something a reader is going to really pick up on, but it's there. Uh, there's also a lot of W's in those two lines. When we go down, we turn the world. Okay, so there's all those W sounds, sort of just gluing though that semantic bit of meaning together in a way that is not conscious and is not, um, it's not something that's really going to leap out to a reader, but it's still going to have a subliminal effect. Um, so I do a lot of that. Um, the opposite of sculpture, a space in solid, a hole shaped like the life of a body worming through time. So we get the B's and the D's there, that like the life, um, you know, the O's in the whole and solid and opposite and world. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on there that's just about word choice that your average reader is not going to pay attention to, but uh, your average poet just loves messing in that stuff. <laughs> is that what you had in mind? Yes, I was just, you know, I was talking about how much I'd love to teach a course in linguistics and poetry and the sibilant sounds and when people use R's and L's, the, the liquids, which yes. disappear as soon as you, I mean, they're just so, um, I want to use the word flimsy. They're, they're unpredictable. They're not stable. And we yeah. use them in poetry to produce that notion of instability. And I think about even Coleridge's uses of the, of the letter M, the M sound, to mm -hmm. elongate the mazy motion of the river in Kubla Khan. I mean, those kinds of just brilliant uses of linguistics is so it's lost when we read silently, but when we read aloud like this, when you're reading your work, we can hear it in our ears so much better, and then we, we understand the importance of poetry and the notion of poetic um, sensibility and aesthetics. It's just lost today, and the only way we get it anymore is, is in the lyrics of music, and I think yeah. rap is one of the best places to find that. Yeah, it's true. It's brilliant. Uh, the... the um Another thing that being conscious of sound as a writer does for you is it means that you don't just rest right. on the first word that comes up. Yeah. You try to find a word that sounds better and does a similar thing, and there are no synonyms, right? Mm -hmm. So when you choose another word, you're choosing a whole other set of connotations, mm -hmm. and that can stretch the concepts and the ideas in the poem so much further. It's very exciting. Kind of thing we get excited about 
as scholars and as writers. <laughs> so Andrew had another follow-up question. I mean, yeah. kind of you hinted at it already. So um, would you or did you conceive of a non-hypertext version, I suppose, of the work as a whole? Um, n no. <laughs> I can see the threads being turned into poems, but I think they would be much, they would, they would work okay standing alone, but they lose the richness of the, of the connection between them. Even as a chapbook, without the shapes of the links in those little boxes, I just think it loses um, more than just a design element. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of a conceptual coherency to that that, mm -hmm. that I find very exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you reflect on the reading process as a whole, I mean, there is... Um, you know, there's a sense of aporia in there as well, which is also unnatural. It was anyway at the time people would have read this for the first time, right? It's like, okay, it's okay until you reach the end of a path and then what? You get stuck, right? So what do I need to do now? And, you know, it's almost like I, I, I keep still, I still play this funny, um, you know, uh, I mean, it's a satire of new media and how, how the IT help desk is constantly getting you know, these impossible calls of people who just don't get it. And it's, it's the medieval monk who's trying to, you Teach know, how to read, read a book. Yes. yes. Turn it upside and down, right? Yeah. Yes. It's that kind of moment where you think, okay, it can be that hard, but why am I not getting it? But, and then you realize that there are certain techniques that you develop, but nobody tells you how to do it, right? Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, this is also poetic, right? Except that people didn't get it at the time. <laughs> a lot of people didn't get it. Um, so, I, yeah. I really like, uh, there's a bit of a contrast in this. I don't like leaving people feeling, I want to treat people to trust me as the writer. Okay? So I don't want to leave them feeling like they're stuck on the edge of a cliff hanging onto, <laughs> hanging onto a bush that's going to get give at any time. I want them to feel like they're standing on that cliff looking over at the vista, okay? Mm -hmm. And not that they're unsecure, you know, in their, in their, their footing. So, uh, so that's, on the other hand, I do want to push the media. At least when I was doing this, I wanted to push the media. Yeah, so that's, um, I don't prescribe to the, I don't prescribe to the feeling that that literature should be like cod liver oil. It's good for you, <laughs> but you <laughs> like it. I think it should be something that you like. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, so that's y yeah. Um, I don't like it when people don't know what to do next for too long. Yeah. I don't mind if you don't know what to yeah. do next for a while, and then you click on the right word and it takes you where you need to go, and then you're fine. But uh, but you know. That you know, we all know that frustrating experience of getting a new piece of software, installing it on your computer, and discovering, I don't know how to get past this point. And the designer yeah. probably made what was perfectly logical to him a choice, but it's not obvious to us. It's That's not right. intuitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't want to be taken out of the flow. You want to be yeah. challenged at the right level at the, at any given time. We have a question from Sarah. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah, <laughs> you know, Sarah Murphy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does sound reconstruct physicality in a digital world? Okay. Very cool. I does sound <laughs> reconstruct physicality in a digital world? Yes. I'm assuming the sound you mean is the sound, the experience of me reading in reading the vi what's visual on the text, on the page. The thing is, words aren't visual. <sighs> Not the same way. Um, you have to know, Sarah is a friend of mine. She's an author. She's been doing um, a, an audio book <laughs> of her most recent novel and been staying in my basement three days a week. 
<laughs> she's not here right now, though. Um, so she's very, very wrapped up in sound these days. She's also a, um, a, a performance artist. So she's, I'm sure she's got an answer to this already while I'm flailing around. But my, when I say text is not visual, it doesn't mean textual form doesn't have a visual component. Of course it does. But the Sassur had taught us that the relationship between the shape of a letter or the shape of a word and the meaning of that word is imposed. It's not intrinsic. And uh, one of my favorite books by uh, one of my favorite profs is um, uh, Phantasm in Fiction. It's about the relationship between, uh, it's about reading. And one of the things that the author, Peter Schwenger, uh, discovered was that we don't read and process visual text in the same parts of our brains. F fMRIs have shown us that when we read, we use one part. When we um, interpret something visually, we use another. So when we see that painting of a pipe that says, Ceci, ce n'est pas une pipe, um, we are using, we're flashing between different parts of our brain to see the pipe and to read the text. And so I don't think sound does reconstruct physicality. I think sound helps us interpret physicality. I think that's how I would state that. And I'm sure we'll talk about it over dinner on Wednesday. Mm. <laughs> I just posted a link to a project that I, I can't, you know, promote enough. It's it's located in South Africa and it's a, it's a project um, that uh, makes and implements uh, locative electronic literature for hearing visually, visually impaired children in a school. Mm -hmm. And so they, the children walk through this garden and they, they there are certain points where they just go um, over sort of um, pla placards with braille and, and you, they can also scan it onto a um, QR code and so on. But what, what it releases is, is poetry made for people who don't have the visual as a sensory input organ or something like that. Mm -hmm. and. And what you were just saying about auditive poetry really made me think about that because the poetry is very different yes. when, when you don't have vision as a reference. Yes. Of course, all the other senses become augmented and it's just so beautiful. And, and, and some of what you were reading reminded me of that. But it's all translation. And, but we can't say that any of it is the originary work, right? Oh, um, no. Of course saying, no. Right. could I do this as a text? as opposed to a hypertext, well, it would be a translation. Mm -hmm. The same thing, reading it out loud is a translation, or maybe an interpretation, but it's a translation. And then putting it into French would be a translation. Right, there, there is, yeah. We don't, we get too hung up on, you know, platonic archetypes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, we do. We get way too hung up on the fact that there has to be an original that everything else falls away from. No, there, there is the thing that's in front of us that we're experienced, experiencing, and then there's the thing that we experience next. And maybe it'll be visual, and maybe it'll be auditory, and maybe it'll be the, from the sense of smell. Who knows what it'll be from? Um, yeah. And I mentioned Tim McLaughlin did a, a, there's like seven different editions slash versions of his work, Notes Beyond Absolute Zero. He actually wrote the work of originally as a hypertext print book so that he could show people what he was really doing. And there's different iterations of it. He put it on cards. So he then, you know, created these kind of card lexias and stacks. Yeah. Which looks almost like hypercard, you know, if you think yeah. about that metaphor. Then on to different iterations of the story space document. It's really a fascinating look at the um, intermediality of these, of the print and the digital simultaneously, and a work that's shifting between the two. It's, I really Technology love that smell. work. And I have, I have in the lab, all of those, he donated all of them to ELO. Oh, so we have brilliant. all the manuscripts, everything from that work. And I just, that's such a dissertation waiting to happen for somebody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> hint, hint. I'm full of dissertations in my brain if somebody's looking for any. Cool. Okay, I'm looking at the chat and I can't see any new questions right now. Okay, I think. Um, Can I ask some real pertinent, like normal questions? Like, Kathy, when you were using this, you used Macintosh. What Macintosh did you make this work on? Where did you get your copy of Story Space? Oh, I was trying to remember this stuff. Uh, mostly through Bob. It was all at Pagecraft, the place where I was working. Um, I believe it was a plus or the next generation after a plus. It wasn't a classic. It was prior to the classic. SE, maybe? SE? Or yeah, SE. Okay. SE. Um, but at some point or another, we got a bigger one. That I would mean, have been a CS or CI or something. Yeah, CS. A CX or CI. Yeah, yeah. But it was the little telephone book mm -hmm. footprint Mac. Um, and... And I'm sure Bob got it for me somehow, or he heard about it, and, and then I got it. But of course, you know, all this was done by mail. I mean, when I talked about, about you know, Bob was so enthusiastic about technology. Um, so we had a computer with a color monitor, mm -hmm. but there were no cameras <laughs> yet then. You couldn't take a screenshot of a color monitor. Mm -hmm. Like, there was no way to do it then. He actually had somebody build a, a frame with cloth behind it and a camera on a tripod so we could take a photograph of the screen hmm. <laughs> and, and get output it that way because it was the only way to output it yeah. at that point. You know, uh, the technology caught up not long after that, but for a few months, that's what we used. Well, even now, um, we're, po we're, po we're pointing a camera at this Macintosh interface. Yes. Right. There's a camera on me, and then on a normal day when pandemic wasn't with us, we'd have somebody roaming around the room doing photographs and videography. So we usually have three cameras working, and mm -hmm. because these computers, you can't do an output for video. No, no, no. It was not available. Mm -mm. No, kids these days. And then how did you find uh, stories? But how did you find story space? Why didn't you? Why, I mean, I honestly don't remember. I don't remember. I would love to say something brilliant about that, but I I really don't remember. I expect it was through Bob. Probably something he was reading. Um, he said, "You need to have this," <laughs> and I and then he probably got it for me, or I got it for me, one or the other. But uh, yeah. May I ask one more question along these lines? I think this is something that Esther is interested in too. So what other hypertext were you reading before mm -hmm. and while you're building this? I mean, obviously you were influenced by other people. Who would that have been? I don't know. Were um, you reading Cat? Were you reading um, Patchwork Love Girl? by Mary Kim Arnold? I mean, that's one of the top. Oh, Patchwork Girl was not out yet, right? Patchwork no, Girl. that's just it. No, Patchwork Girl. As a year the later. things that are coming to mind were subsequent. Yeah. It would have been quibbling. I mean, what was out during this time would have been quibbling. Michael Joyce's work, uh, Vicky Garden. I think Joyce. I definitely had read Joyce. Lust. But honestly, hardly anything. I was in Halifax. <laughs> I read the Gandhi. same time that I was working on this. I was also taking a typography course uh, because I, I didn't actually do graphic design when I was at NASCAD, so I was catching up on it. And we were using movable type. We were using 19th century movable type at the same right. time that I was making the hypertext. <laughs> well, can, can I take that prompt and, and very briefly refer us back to the um, the cover, the title image? Oh, and, yes. Um, do you want to say a few words about that? Because it has yes. this print, you know, a sense, this print like, idea. Yes. It, it is a photocopy, I believe, of a scarf. Okay. Uh, so that's an ECAT scarf. That's where you're getting those cross-hatching shapes. Mm -hmm. The other one was a black and white kind of flowery scarf that I had that was behind it. But that's where those that's where those those patterns came from. I like the one because it's warp and wefty, and I like the other one because it's more spiral image. <laughs> and when I oh, think curved. about textiles, yeah. I think of threads or I think about weaving, spinning and weaving. Those are like the two basic things. So conceptually, that was very, very basic to me. 
Yeah. And you also you also worked with the fonts, right? In the um, the styles, like you know, you have some yes. italics at the beginning and at the end. Yeah. Was there something that linked at to the beginning and the, the end of the poems or of the? I don't know. I, I'm not sure whether you can see the image right now, but um, it's it's when I speak, people can see it behind oh, me. Oh, unnatural habitat. Well, that was un un and the yeah the the un and the ats. Yeah. So it's natural habits, natural habit and unnatural habitats. You can read it. Okay. If you take away the acid, yeah. acid the yeah. italics, you can read natural habits or mm -hmm. unnatural habitats. So okay. Just give you a sense of the possibility, linguistic possibility. That's also, you know, 1990s graphic design stuff. <laughs> it's really cool. I mean, I, I love that because we were talking about uh, earlier about conventions and how, you know, the, the natural is very much bound to, to what we we're used to, right? And what we think is possible. And the pandemic has taught us so many things that, <laughs> that are possible all of a sudden, right? Yes. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you for talking about that a little bit. Thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think I'm still scanning the, the chat in case people um, wanted to catch up a little bit, but I think, that might I be think we covered all the questions. Please uh, shout out just by putting ah or something in the chat if we haven't covered your question yet. Because <laughs> um, if not, I would just like to thank Kathy very, very much again for working with us on this traversal. It's um, we, we realized that, um, you know, busy the, these are busy times and, and uh, it was um, cumbersome to look at all this, this material and to make it bring it back to life. But it, it was I, I enjoyed the, the rehearsal just as much as I enjoyed the traversal and, and uh, I learned an awful lot and I have to say I mean through this performance um, the entire thing came even more to life than, than when I read it for the first time and then again for the book. So um, thank you so much and thank, thank you. you also again to, to Dean and Holly and everyone else here who's, who's been helping. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a delight. I quite enjoyed it. May I mention to everybody that next Friday, the lab is hosting a special launch party for Richard Holton's hypertext, created in, 19, in 2001, called Fugursky at Finhorn on acid. And yes, it is that acid. And uh, the lab has migrated that work from story space into open web languages. And it was a great undertaking. It took numerous months to do it. Richard's going to be reading some of the work, uh, some of the text. We're going to have Mariusz Prozarski talking about kind of giving a scholarly background of it, and the lab will be talking about its construction, like what it took to migrate story space into something else. This version that we're releasing next week is the archival version, which is the step one of a two-part step that we plan to do. The second step is to do a scholarly edition that will overlay on that hypertext open web language version. Mariusz and I will be developing that along with Michael Trackner and Richard Holton. So that, that will be released in about a year and a half from now. So big project, almost over, but it's exciting. And you're welcome to join us. Just email me at dgregar at wsu.edu, and I'll send you a link. And I once again, thank you, Kathy. I just love this work, and I love the poet poetic nature of it. And thank you for spending your time with us and for sharing your story and the lore. Astrid, thanks for your leadership. It's been great working with you this year. Good luck to you now that you're in Bergen. So while we're in the middle of this big season of nine traversals, she moved from Canada <laughs> to Bergen in the middle of a pandemic with two small children. So she's had a very um, exciting year with lots of change. And I think she's going to get a much needed break after this is all over, I hope. I'm going on sabbatical and working with Mariusz on the book. So please reach out to us anytime you want to the L Lab, Elit Lab on Twitter, Facebook, and on our on our uh, website. Please reach out to me anytime you want if you have questions. Thank you, Greg, for your help today, and John for being in the lab. Hugs to everybody out in the world listening and participating today. Thank you. All right.
Houston, contact with the test. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, five, 